Welcome to this session where we're going to be looking at the deployment of a COVID vaccine around the world. Now, a second wave of COVID-19 is unfurling across parts of the world, and that's focusing minds even more acutely on the urgency of delivering a viable vaccine once approved, of course. Now, hundreds of candidates, uh, 10, are in phase two three trials right at the moment, and it's a frantic scramble that's exposed the best and the worst in this COVID-19, and the desire for vaccine access has laid bare nationalistic tendencies and brutally exposed the iniquity underpinning access to health. Also serious and legitimate questions are being raised over whether some nations are disregarding safety standards in a bid to be the first to develop the jab. Yet in the midst of all of this, we are reminded of the selfless excellence of our scientists and burgeoning solidarity shown by some who remind us we are in the same boat, rich and poor. And for this to work, we all need protection. Well, the COVID initi COVAX initiative is a shining example of that. We've got so much to discuss, so little time. So let's get going and please do get involved using the hashtag, hashtag SDIS, on slido.com to send us in your questions. So we've got a fantastic panel uh, this evening and together we'll be looking at the solutions, the pitfalls facing the world as it tries to meet the challenges of making a vaccine globally available. And joining us this evening, we have Richard Hatchett. Now he's Chief Executive Officer and Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. That's CEPI and is based in Norway. And CEPI is co-lead of COVAX with the WHO and Gavi. Now, Julie Gaberding is an American infectious disease expert and the former director of the US Center for Disease Control. She's now executive vice president and chief patient officer at Merck. So absolutely fantastic to have her thoughts and insights this evening. We're also joined by Mr. Seth Berkeley. Now he's CEO of Gavi, that's the Vaccine Alliance and also a COVAX co-leading organization. And of course, COVAX is gonna be central to our discussion this evening. We're also joined by Cypress Saad. Now he is the president of Developing Countries Vaccine Manufacturing Network and president of Quality Operations at Bharat Biotech International Limited. So very, very big welcome to you there. And finally, we're joined by Heidi Larson, Professor of Anthropology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She's the director of the Vaccine Confidence Project, so also an essential issue that we'll be evoking. But before we get stuck into our discussion, we're absolutely privileged to be joined by Professor Klaus Schwab. Now, he's the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum and is going to be making some opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. This session uh, deploying a COVID-19 vaccine is actually part of uh, our Social uh, Development Impact Summit, which um, started four days ago, and we are at the end. And I have to tell you, in the 60 sessions uh, which um, uh, we had over the last, uh, year, uh, over the last days, um, with great public pa uh, participation, the issue of COVID-19 vaccines, uh, I think it came up practically in every session because uh, many of the issues we discussed are dependent on what progress we are making in uh, the development and deployment of the vaccine. So I'm looking very much forward uh, to this fantastic um, panel where we have all aspects integrated I, I just would, would add one personal note. I'm uh, so happy uh, to see this because um, 20 years ago, uh, Gavi was created uh, and the first place was uh, Davos. And in a similar way, Richard, um, uh, three years ago, um, CP was uh, also had as a first place Davos. And I think your two organizations have done uh, a fantastic job um, in um, advancing uh, the notion of, uh, let's say, importance, and but also practical action around uh, the, the vaccine. So back to you, uh, Isabel. Thank you, Thank very, you very much, Professor Klaus Schwab. And as you said, Professor Klaus Schwab really what is needed. And on that issue, I'd like to bring in Seth immediately because the countries represent, representing two thirds of the world's population have now signed up to COVAX. Now, 
There are obviously more countries are in the pipeline to join, but can you tell us what the next steps are for COVAX? And for those joining us, explain to us in briefly, if you can, the importance of this COVAX facility. Well, of course, um, uh, thank you. And thank you, Klaus, for those uh, comments about our birthday and, and Seppi's birthday that we celebrated earlier these years. Um, you know, the critical issue here is a vaccine is the way we're going to get out of this pandemic. Of course, there are many other interventions that are critical, but that is the best way we have to go back towards normal. And science has done an incredible job. You went through the statistics and normally it's you know, seven to 10 years to make a vaccine. We're within one year still. We're now nine and a half months into it, and we have all of these vaccines and efficacy trials. The challenge is, should those go to a few countries who are able to pay and get high coverage, leaving the rest of the countries with no vaccine, or should we have a distrib distribution across the world? And of course, from our belief in a fast moving pandemic, you're not safe unless everybody's safe. So what the COVAX facility is trying to do is to get vaccine out to all countries, rich and poor, at the same time. Initially, small amounts of doses to protect healthcare workers and those most at risk risk, but of course, eventually, uh, the broader sets of the population that are going to need access. And to do that, we have to work with the pharmaceutical industry to have them scale up. And we're looking to try to have 2 billion doses by the end of 2021, which would be an extraordinarily never before done. And lastly, of course, is going to be the challenges in delivering them. Okay, so, so it is an absolutely humongous task, let's say, Seth, but um, if I could bring Richard on board now. Richard, what do you see as the main challenges uh, as you push ahead with COVAX? Uh, is it purely financial or do we veer into the political as well? Well, there, there are a number of, of challenges. The, the political challenges uh, are, of, of course, everyone is aware of them. Um, what we have seen are countries that really until COVAX was created and, and they didn't have an option to work together to solve the pandemic, at least where vaccines were concerned. Uh, and, behave, and so the countries were behaving in their own rational self-interest, but as, as, as Seth was describing, that was going to result in misallocation of vaccine and concentration of vaccine in a few rich nations, leaving the vast majority of countries without access to vaccine at all. That would have been a tremendous problem. It would have been inequitable and it would have resulted in the perpetuation of the pandemic. The challenges that COVAX has faced um, are that we have had to devise the institutional arrangements in real time to, to develop and create a place and a space for international collaboration in the, the development, procurement and delivery of vaccines. Each one of those elements is a, a, a very hard challenge in and of itself. Designing a system that can solve all of those elements at the same time, a tremendous challenge. But I think what's encouraging is the emerging momentum around global solidarity, global collaboration to meet these challenges and a willingness actually to work with us as we have designed the COVAX facility and accept that not all questions you know, are answered at this time, but if we work together in a collaborative and transparent spirit, we'll make progress to move forward. Absolutely, and just a very quick question there, Richard, um, but you see, talk about this multi-layered approach that's having to kind of draw together at the same time. Just how many people are working on COVAX just to try and get this vaccine, once it's approved, distributed in an equitable way? Well, it, I mean, it certainly depends on how you, you count people. I mean, I think, Seth, our, our latest numbers are up to 167 countries that have, uh, 157 countries, sorry, um, that are, you know, collaborating together. So within those countries, you, you probably have hundreds of people that have been working on it. Within Gavi and CEPI and WHO and our partner organizations and our industry partners, I would say thousands of, of people working together to bring this to fruition. Uh, it's a phenomenal project and a phenomenal effort. Now, uh, Julie, could you just uh, come in here and just tell us about what's in the pipeline at Merck? Because you're also developing vaccines and treatments against COVID-19. Um, by, um, I'd like to just start by acknowledging that in just the first six months of this pandemic, more than 700 products 
for either treatment or prevention of SARS-CoV-2 went into pipelines at various stages. This is absolutely unprecedented in the history of the world. Um, just think of, of the AIDS epidemic where it was several years before we even had a test and it took 15 years to get highly active antiviral therapy. So we're living in an era where the science has brought possibilities. At MSD, we are prosecuting two vaccines that we hope will be relevant. Uh, we have kind of the mind that it's not likely that a single vaccine is going to solve the world's problems because there are different populations and different requirements, both in the early phases as well as potentially for a more sustained engagement in coronavirus prevention. But I also want to mention antivirals because, of course, if we could take the mortality of this disease down quickly, uh, it buys us a lot of time to really get to that global uh, overall prevention platform that we're looking for. So MSD is working on an oral antiviral that we're, we're hoping will be relevant and others are working on modalities including antibodies and other um, small molecule approaches. So uh, I, I don't think we should put all of our eggs in the vaccine basket, but clearly it's a huge component of really securing global protection and we have to prioritize it. And I just want to thank Richard and Seth for their leadership of the COVAX effort. It's just um, game changing. That is an absolute perfect segue. Thank you very much, Judy, because I'd just like to bring in Sai. And my, my question is for you, uh, in terms of developing countries, now, is COVAX going to be that game changer? Is everything in line now as you see it to be able to provide that change that needs to be unfurled in the developing world quickly and effectively? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Um, I think COVAX is that game changer because, you know, you know, if you look at the history of vaccines and if you look at this response by the global community to COVID-19, um, it's extremely important how we react to this. And COVAX is right in the epicenter of that reaction. And it's extremely important part of this uh, response to COVID-19, not just in high-income countries, middle-income countries, but also in low-income countries. And where this is bringing to bear is that this is, we are at the, I would say we are at the beginning of the beginning. Um, as you know, vaccine development takes decades. Um, we are just at the end of the first year and we have a few candidates that are moving forward. Uh, none of them are successful yet. Uh, time will tell, the next three to four months are very crucial as to which one of these candidates uh, will be successful. But I would say that's the, you know, end of the beginning, I would say, because once you know what is successful, then you need to manufacture that at scale. Some manufacturers are already working on manufacturing these vaccines at scale. Um, some of us can maybe make it in the tens of millions of doses. Others could may maybe make it in the hundreds of millions of doses. That remains to be seen. But the next, the devil is in the details, I would say. The next steps after you manufacture you need to get these products approved by international regulatory agencies, US, Europe, the WHO for pre-qualification, many uh, low-income country and middle-income country NRAs, and then you need to distribute it. Because many of us, uh, Gavi, uh, many of us are used to manufacturing and distributing uh, vaccines for routine immunization, which is for childhood immunization, which is a subset of the population that we are targeting. And so now we are in the uh, gamut of delivering these vaccines to pretty much all populations or the high-risk populations at first. So that is something that we have not done before at the kind of scale that we are talking about. I think that needs a deeper discussion. There has been a significant discussion on R&D, innovation, product development, clinical tri uh, trials, and manufacturing scale-up. But we also need to talk about distribution and getting it to the populations that need it most. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sai. So that's definitely something we'll be bringing up. But um, before we go any further, I'd really like to bring in Heidi, who has joined us. Uh, and Heidi, one of the issues that is going to be 
holding people back from taking a vaccine are just a whole load of concerns that can't be really just pinpointed and put into one category. And I was just reading some research in the UK that uh, a lot of people won't even take it, have a vaccine, even if it is available. Now, I know that you've looked into the issues of rumours, etc., that stop people getting vaccinated. But if you could just outline for us, one of the main reasons why people will just not go and get this inoculation, even though the government advice is to go and do so. Well, there's a, there's a real mix of reasons, and some of it is frankly quite understandable. This is a, a brand, I mean, it's a brand new virus, and there's a lot of uncertainty around that itself. And if people aren't even believing that that's a real virus, why would you, you know, be caring about a vaccine? Um, and the other part of it is that the information is uncertain. So we have to have a little bit of empathy with the people who say. I'm not sure. I think a lot of the surveys uh, have put into their headlines overstated refusals because they they lump together those who really say I would not take it to those who say I'm not sure. When in fact that's it's pretty reasonable to not be sure in the current uh, environment. So, but but there are um, it's highly varied by country. Um, what concerns me is that some of the uh, countries that are starting to say they are uh, not going to take it more, we've seen Nigeria, Pakistan, um, uh, DRC was uh, the, the least willing, and the knock-on effect um, it's having on some of the overall vaccine confidence. So I think that the good news is we have time. I'm just finishing five years of working on trust building and rumor management around Ebola vaccine trials in multiple African countries. The, the thing that was an absolute asset was having time to, to start to build that. I think we, you know, we can get in there and start um, communicating, engaging around some basic vaccines. We've lost so much time on really childhood vaccines, the flu vaccines. Uh, I just got uh, uh, data back from our EU study, 15% increase in willingness and confidence in the flu vaccine. We're seeing you know, other confidence rising around pneumonia vaccine. Let's encourage the you know, people around things they know they're familiar with and in, their, in that interaction, start having a conversation about COVID. Um, I think we, we have time, we can change, change the grounds. Uh, I'd just like to bring in Julie here, obviously, because you're developing some of these vaccines and treatments. Isn't one of the major concerns when it comes to the pickup of this vaccine is, as, as everyone has been brought up, is the phenomenal speed the vaccine will inevitably be brought online and that that has sparked a lot of concerns in people. So Judy, you who are involved in this, what could you do to reassure people that really safety checks, most countries are not going to neglect safety checks? Yeah, I, I think people are concerned. And as Heidi said, it's a very understandable concern that in our race to get um, some additional population protection that safety shortcuts will occur. And that is not the case. In fact, uh, the major vaccine manufacturers signed a vaccine pledge just very recently promising that they would adhere to the safety requirements of the regulatory agents and not jump ahead of the curve in an effort to so-called win the race or get a product out there as quickly as as the efficacy would allow. So I think we ourselves are self-policing and making sure that we don't overstep that confidence barrier. But there are a lot of other things that need to be done. And, and Heidi, thank you for bringing up the uh, Ebola virus situation because um, as MSD developed our now licensed Ebola vaccine and utilized it both in West Africa and the DRC, we learned so much ground truth about what happens in cultures that aren't used to investigational products or aren't yeah. used to new launches and how much community engagement and local leadership really matters. But I think the opposite end of the spectrum is also true. Uh, we need to uh, involve the, the really important opinion leaders, the trusted and credible doctors at the local level, as well as scientists more broadly, to first of all be 
informed of the actual facts, not the mythology or the political interpretation of those facts, and then really stand strong, honestly and transparently explaining what we know, what we don't know, and what we're doing to try to assess the safety of these new products. Trust is everything. Trust is everything. And Seth, I would just like to bring some of the, uh, the issues that Heidi was also bringing up uh, about that the vaccine reticence in countries like Nigeria, like DRC. Uh, when you want to distribute uh, the vaccine or co new COVID vaccine in an equitable way, this is going to prove a real challenge for you, is it not? Uh, how are you going to prioritize distribution in countries and how can you try and convince those populations that it is absolutely necessary for them that frontline workers are actually vaccinated? Well, of course, we have a great panel here, each of whom are working on these topics. And I want to start by um, uh, building on what Julie said, because, you know, with the Ebola vaccine, this was done at minus 80 degrees delivery in a war-torn area. And it was a vaccine that wasn't licensed initially. And they were able to, under a clinical trial protocol, roll it out, collect more information on safety, under informed consent, and get it out. But it took this intense engagement with the community. And the only reason I wanted to mention all that is it is possible to do it even under the most difficult situations, but one has to plan for that. So I, I think if we look at what's happened, you know, 20, 30 years ago, vaccine coverage was low. Today, it is quite high. It's the most widely distributed health intervention in the world. And we've introduced 496 new vaccines. Sai is right, most of those are pediatric vaccines, but we've also had vaccines for um, epidemic diseases, population-based, you know, things like yellow fever, things like meningitis, and we've been able to do that. The way to do that, is, as Heidi has said so clearly, is engagement with the community, is having trusted spokespeople, is making sure there are facts available, but facts alone don't make this happen. What we really need is to also move with people's hearts and that that trust issue is absolutely critical so it is doable but it requires attention the last thing i'll say is that you know the alliance it's not just the gavi secretariat who unicef the world bank the cdc all of these partners are going to work together with countries to help. And that, that work has already started. Toolkits have been built to help country begin to plan for these vaccine rollouts and to understand what's going to be needed. I'd like to bring Richard in here. Now, we are getting receiving questions on Slido, and I've received this question, which is, uh, what is needed, and it was, it was something that Sai evoked, to establish a global mechanism under leadership of the WHO and Gavi to ensure... Um, to ensure an equitable and criteria that's based on the distribution of the new vaccine. So I guess the question is, how do you actually establish such a intricate and complex global mechanism to distribute this vaccine? And, and if that work is obviously underway already, what has been established so far? Well, I, I, th I think there are two pieces to the answer to the question. One, one is the logistics, and, and I'll come back to that in just a minute. The, the second, and I think the more interesting piece, and the piece that will probably, if it works, will be studied for years, is how do you create a, a system that balances the different incentives of the different stakeholders to work together in a collaborative way? A, a lot of observers have noted that the, the scramble for vaccine in many ways, you know, is a real world illustration of a prisoner's dilemma. And, and, and we, myself, Seth, uh, Sumi Swaminathan from WHO, Dr. Tedros and other colleagues have, have been thinking, you know, very hard about how would you design a system that incentivizes our industry partners to work with us, that incentivizes countries to work together and to collaborate with us. And that, and that brings all of that together in a, in a way that is self-supporting. That's a really interesting problem. The, the problem of actually then, once that system is constructed and functioning and, and you know, vaccine is beginning to be provided into that system, how you actually solve the logistical challenge of having, let, let us speculate and say, we end up with five or six COVID vaccines that have different characteristics in a, in a complicated global environment where different countries have different regulatory regimes um, may have 
different on the ground challenges in terms of delivering certain kinds of vaccines, the, the, you know, based on cold chain requirements or other challenges. How do, how do you make all of that system come together so that vaccine is efficiently distributed in a way that also achieves this goal of population equity? That's a huge challenge. We, to be utterly candid, we are still working through that as, as we go. And we haven't solved all of the challenges yet, but we are beginning to identify them and we have partners lined up. And as COVAX has achieved momentum and even I would humbly suggest a sense of inevitability that this is going to be one of the very important mechanisms for delivering vaccine, we have more and more help to solve these practical logistical challenges. And just, and just very briefly now, how, how much of a blow is it for COVAX that big players like the China, China and US aren't on board? And are you any closer to persuading them to join? Well, let me, let me answer first and then, and, then, and then Seth can certainly jump in. And I think other, other colleagues may have valuable opinions to, to put in. But I mean, I think in, in many respects, it was not a surprise to us that in particular that the United States and China, because of their extensive internal domestic vaccine development efforts and their investments uh, in vaccine development, might feel that they had a, a sufficient number of candidates that they would be able to account for the needs of their own populations. So may not view COVAX as a necessary delivery mechanism for their domestic needs. But there is also a, a, a way that these countries can continue and can still contribute to the global effort uh, that COVAX is, is trying to lead and would do so out of enlightened self-interest because it will help end the pandemic sooner and help them restore their economies. And that's through contributing either funds or doses to support distribution, particularly to developing countries. And of course, they are contributing scientifically. I mean, we are working, some of the COVAX uh, portfolio companies are based in the US, some are based in China, and we continue to have productive dialogues with, with scientists um, you know, in those countries, but also globally. So there are many ways that countries can contribute to the global effort. They don't all necessarily entail you know, buying doses for domestic use. I'd like to bring Richard, in side. To, oh, no, continue. Can I just sorry. add to that, Richard, that um, while the governments may or may not at this point in time be joining the COVAX, um, in the US, for example, the vaccine inventors are part of the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations. And by virtue of our membership in this international association, we are very much involved in contributing to COVAX. So there are other avenues to bring the science and the inventiveness to, to be helpful, even if a given country is not actively participating in the procurement efforts. And then I was just actually then tacking on from what you were just saying, Sai, as, as an outside observer, I suppose, and when you look at COVAX, uh, do you think there can be a conflict of interest? And I imagine maybe Seth and Richard will have something to say here, but that high income countries who are developing their own vaccines in this kind of so-called you know, vaccine nationalism are also part of COVAX. Can the two work together? I... You know, I think I think they can work together, but it's a matter of the kind of product development they do, and it's a matter of kind of the delivery systems and the delivery mechanisms that companies have in mind. Because what may work for, let's say, U.S. or Europe uh, or China uh, may or may not work in middle-income and other low-income countries. Uh, what worked, for example, for Ebola uh, may not work for uh, COVID-19 vaccines. I mean, if a vaccine has to be stored at extremely low temperatures, or if it has to be, for example, say, lyophilized and to be uh, having an edge, I mean, uh, diluent to be carried along with it, then all of this adds to the burden of uh, distribution, administration, biomedical waste disposal, all aspects of vaccines and vaccinations. And that WHO and UNICEF and Gavi and PAHO know very well about this. And it's not just the fact of making a vaccine, but you need to transport it with care. It has to be delivered with care. The biomedical waste has to be disposed. So there are many, many, many aspects of this. A simple concept of a vaccine vial monitor 
that is really required by WHO that is an important marker of vaccine safety and quality in, in, at the point of use is very important. If a, if a company is not able to put that on to a vaccine, then it poses difficulties uh, down the distribution chain. Uh, so I just a very, very quick, simple question here, but I, I've just been seeing that Johnson & Johnson is developing a single dose vaccine. Now, surely in terms of distribution and getting this out across developing countries, uh, that's a development to be welcomed, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Anything that's a single dose, anything that is uh, stable at, uh, I would say, either at, um, you know, in, at room temperature, not at room temperature, but at least at five degrees, uh, or there is also extensive experience in shipping vaccines at minus 20 because the oral polio vaccine is stored at minus 20 and it's shipped around the world. There are many companies still that have minus 20 cold chains, so that can be leveraged. So it, I think countries also have, uh, companies also have to look at what are the issues of the developing world during product development. I think after licensure, it might be a bit too late because you are already committed to your uh, product development and manufacturing and formulation schemes. I think you need to look at it right during the product development. And that's what I think many companies are doing uh, around the world. But if they only have a US or a European focus, they may not uh, see the requirement of what is needed in middle income and low income countries. And I think COVAX, um, I think will bring that out. I think WHO's target product profile has already brought that out. I think companies have to look at that and cater to those requirements. Okay, uh, I, Heidi, I just have a question for you that we have received on Slido. Um, and it's about this question of trust that we were talking about. And this was a question, I think it comes from Politico Europe, and it says, do you think there needs to be more transparency on the deals between countries and drug makers so that it can be more easily scrutinized? Now, is there an opacity there already in the first place? And do you think, especially the drugs that need to deal with COVID, that there does really need to be more transparency given the speed that uh, this whole vaccination and drugs are, are going online? Well, I, I totally uh, agree with the trust issue and overall transparency. Um, I often say we don't really have a misinformation problem as much as a relationship problem between publics and, and industry and science and um, but I, I don't think that, I mean, I, I, I think that it's been actually quite a bit of um, exposure about the different negotiations going on. I, I do, I think actually where some of the uh, transparency is really going to need to happen is in deciding who gets it first. Um, because I think that, and, and what are the criteria? Um, and not just announcing um, things at different times, but I think any way in any part of this, uh, the multi-phase uh, processes we have to go through, as Richard outlined very clearly in the beginning, uh, throughout all of them, the more that we can be uh, transparent and, and sharing without, I mean, we don't want to create another infodemic. <laughs> I mean, infodemic is not just bad news. It's uh, just an overload of information. So, I mean, you, you have to find a fine line between being transparent when it's appropriate and when it resonates, because you don't want to also contribute to this this sea of, of different stages of information by putting out pieces of pieces of it. At the same time, you don't want to wait until the 11th hour. So it's not easy, but um, I would just, yeah, uh, encourage transparency. But um, one of the things that's also frustrating the public is that, you know, there the rules keep changing. Um, and there seems to be conflicting guidance. And so you don't want to keep putting things out and then changing them all the time. So it's finding a balance, I think. Finding a balance. Now, I'd like to bring up something uh, that you've just brought up and, and, and put it to Seth, actually, because um, Seth, you, we, I know that COVAX ha has actually already decided in some respects who does get a vaccine first. What have you put into place there and who will be your priorities and how will you implement that fast? What is going to be the rate at which these vaccines will be deployed? 
Well, of course, WHO provides normative guidance for most countries, and they will continue to suggest, and particularly as we learn more about the virus, what the risk groups might be in different situations. But where we started was frontline health workers, because unlike in the West, where you have a, you know, a fair number of them, but we've seen what happens when they get sick or they have to go into quarantine, how that can you know, increase the overwhelming of the health system in developing countries. And we saw this in the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, countries were devastated because there's so few health workers. So one of the questions was, could we get vaccine out to all those frontline health workers across the world? And that's a relatively small number comparatively, we think kind of a maximum number of 3%, and then from there to go into higher risk populations. Now, the question we got asked early on is, is that realistic? Are people going to follow guidelines? It'll be up to individual countries, of course. But what I think we learned from the Ebola situation, we might have thought also in DRC that, you know, it would have just gone to rich people and people wouldn't have gotten it. But actually, there was pretty good attendance to having those vaccine used for the people who really needed it and to be able to help control the epidemic and for health workers. And, and so, I, you know, I think we learn from the experience and it's going to be important to make sure everybody understands why, but that's how we'll follow it. The last thing I'd say is the reason we need a bespoke plan for every country is in the U.S., for example, you know, it might be prisons or meatpacking plants or other, you know, situations, obviously the elderly and risk groups. In developing countries, you may not have a very large elderly population, but you may have urban slums or, or, or displaced people or refugees. And so that's why we really have to understand the local situation, even though we can have global guidelines. It's absolutely fascinating. Sally, we really don't have much time left. So I'd like to ask you all a question because you, you, we've all evoked uh, Ebola uh, this evening. And so uh, there's been a number of epidemics, pandemics, this obviously the most serious. But if we draw upon what's been learned, do you think we're any more prepared as a result of this, given that we're warned by the WHO and other organizations that, that this could become the new normal? What lessons have been learned from this that can be used to be drawn upon in the future to make a an actions against any future pandemic or epidemic more efficacious and faster. Uh, how about starting with you, Julie? Uh, if we haven't learned our lesson this time, I don't think we're ever going to. Um, <clears throat> I've been watching this from AIDS to SARS to monkeypox, uh, the pandemic in 2009 and, and feeding forward. Each time we have a new challenge, we promise to do certain things and we do bring our level of preparedness up a notch or two, but that sustained commitment to truly creating global health security, we have not tipped. And I pray and am personally doing everything I can in my network, but also in my role as the co-chair of the Commission on Global Health Security to really try to make sure that while we're fighting this pandemic, we're preparing for the next, because I do believe it's only a matter of time before we face another one of these situations or potentially something even worse. So now is the time to prepare. Now is the time to prepare. Uh, Heidi, I'm just wondering, given these issues of vaccine nationalism, we've seen it in Europe, borders went up as soon as COVID-19 struck. We've seen countries develop and buy up billions of doses of vaccine. Do you think there is the beginnings of an understanding, particularly if you look in Europe, that there has to be more unity when it comes to health. We hear about a European health union and the burgeoning European health union possibly. Do you think that that might catch on or do you think we're possibly going the other way? Well, I think it's it's all about bad timing because we, this COVID happened to land in a, a most hyper polarized political landscape that we've had in a long time. We've, we're in a, an era of anti-globalization, uh, it just fits right into um, all the current environment. I think, you know, if we can get the underlying ferment to, um, and we be able to switch our, our gears and be less polarized. I mean, the, the challenge with epidemics in general is, you know, what else is going on? 
And what's what's going to, I mean, in DRC, COVID landed in the middle of the Ebola trials. In another country, there was an earthquake while there was a, well, they're running to, to work on COVID. So in, in the politics of it all is, I mean, historically, vaccines were the um, were just the epitome of uh, health diplomacy. It was used to stop, you know, people fighting in wars. They would put their guns down for, for you know, a, a few days so that people could be vaccinated. Um, I, I think there is there are some new innovations and there are some new certainly trust building efforts. I think that what I've seen in the positive sense is um, community volunteerism. I mean, we talk about a lot of the dissent, but you know, there have been people have been incredibly resourceful, innovative. Um, I, I, I don't. I'm sure many of us know our neighborhood much better than we did uh, before COVID. Um, there, there, are, and that's I think, I think even locally um, to start there. I mean, I remember, you know, working on some of the same epidemics that Julie talks about and I even well not just natural epidemics but the like uh, 911 but you know have you stocked your fridge do you have water you have some really basic things but I, I think we will not forget I mean the world will not there will be the pre-COVID and post-COVID world um, we should remind ourselves that the reason we have CEPI is because of Ebola um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I remind people about that. There's so much anxiety about fast, but I said, well, you know what, did you, are we talking about why it's faster? Because we did learn things from Ebola. And, and I think one of the things uh, moving forward on this is, um, is, is trust. I mean, the importance of trust. I, and I think we, you know, the bigger answer has to do with current politics that, are a bit bigger than the unfortunately undermining some of the situation right now. Certainly a very big question will be the subject of a, another whole a session. Um, we're, yeah. we're getting very low on time, unfortunately, but uh, Seth, I'd, I'd like to bring, bring you in. Do you think we're going to come out of this any wiser uh, in terms of how to deal with pandemics? Do we learn every time something new will we be able to act faster and more efficiently? So, so three quick answers. So first of all, it is evolutionarily certain we will have more outbreaks. So I agree with Julie. Second, the way to build better is to build routine systems. And that's why having a strong routine health system, that a resilient health system, having delivery for vaccines, those types of things are, are really important. The last thing, though, is to have continued investment. And the challenge in the past has been we invest, we invest, we invest, then we stop because, you know, there's no longer an epidemic. This time, the cost has been somewhere between nine and 12 trillion dollars. I do hope what Julie said is right, is that people will now say, oh, my God, a little bit of investment, a little bit of preparation during peacetime mm -hmm. is exactly mm -hmm. the right thing to do to make sure that we are prepared. And we can work with the new instruments we've built, but we will even need to build new ones, better surveillance systems, you know, better understanding of disease, but we need to fund it in peacetime. Oh, I am so disappointed. The time has gone so fast and I haven't even had a chance to speak to Richard or Cy just to get their final thoughts, but the conversation is continuing anyway, yeah. but we're going to have to wrap up this session. And I just want to thank you very much, really from the bottom of my heart. I found this absolutely fascinating and uh, it's been wonderful talking to you. Many thanks, uh, Richard Hatchett, Seth Berkeley, Cy Prasad, Julie Gaberding, and of course, Heidi Larson. Brilliant discussion, of course, Professor Klaus Schwab, for your opening remarks. Much, uh, uh, Isabel. Thank you all. It was a fascinating discussion. I, I wonder whether I should go out of this discussion more optimistic or, uh, let's say, with cautious, uh, at least with cautious optimism. And I think you contributed to it. Let's hope that we have a vaccine and that we can distribute it in a fair way and in a fast way. Thank you all.